Hey everyone, this is Arif. I just have a quick ask before we get into the show today. If you could just please subscribe to the podcast and whatever player you're listening to this on and leave us a five-star rating and review. That does the absolute most to get our name out there and help people find us. Um, if you're looking for any other way to support the show, you can head over to thelifeofxpodcast.com and uh, click on our support page. All right, thank you. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is Arif Jadala. And my name is Melvin Barnes. And that makes this the life of X. Today we are continuing with our, uh, this is part two of Dwight D. Eisenhower. We last left off with uh, Ike's leaving Manila after his relationship with MacArthur had soured and becoming a brigadier general in 1941 following the Louisiana maneuvers, which just to remind everyone were gigantic war games meant to test American military doctrine. Which came in at a fairly good timing because, as we all know, in December of 1941, the Japanese Imperial Navy launches a surprise attack at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And this essentially brings the United States into World War II. And this is where kind of Ike becomes the Ike we all know and love. Yeah. So, you know, after Ike leaves Manila, he ends up back in D.C. But this isn't him living kind of the high life that he lived in D.C. before. This is wartime D.C. This is wartime D.C., which means the population of D.C. has actually more than doubled. Basically, all of these uh, military men and leaders have been funneled into D.C., so there's really not a whole lot of uh, lavish living quarters. Can you imagine that? Just, what, like, we're in Columbus. We're in beautiful, snowy Columbus, Ohio. Mm. I mean, can you imagine if the, the population just doubled? I'd be upset. Yeah, I mean, already ridiculously expensive to find a place to live here anyway. Fairly imagine, cheap. Imagine if you double the... Oh, that would, no, that's the part that would make me upset. Because I think Columbus is fairly cheap, but with all these people coming in, like, if I had like to pay, like, not even New rent. York prices, let's say, like, the worst spot in Long Island prices, I'd be, I'd be pretty upset. Yeah. Um, well, Ike and uh, Mamie, they are living in a pretty small one-bedroom apartment in D.C., but... In terms of his career, Ike is moving pretty quickly. So General Marshall and Ike draw up a directive outlining the establishment of the position of the commander of the European Theater of Operations. And then Ike is named to this position. Three weeks after he's made the ETO commander, Ike was promoted to lieutenant general, leapfrogging 66 generals, including Patton, who was his senior. And, just and a ten- legend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a, a war veteran and legend. And Ike has, you know, in one foul swoop, leapfrogged all of them. And in just 10 weeks, Ike had moved from brigadier to lieutenant general, one star to literally three stars, uh, moving ahead of 228 officers with greater seniority, becoming the 18th highest ranked active officer in the army. Bam. Bang. Meteoric rise. Yeah, so... Ike arrives in London in June of 1942 to assume his post as uh, ETO commander. He immediately set to work making changes to the way things were done uh, at the headquarters. Ike, when he shows up, is actually pretty upset about how things are running. So when several division heads arrived at 10 a.m., he immediately put everyone on seven-day weeks. Yeah, I mean, he put people on notice. One thing about Ike is that for whatever faults he may have had in different things, you know, cheating on his wife, that sort of stuff, one thing about the man was he worked hard. Yeah, you weren't going to slack on Ike's watch. No, you weren't, and that's because Ike wasn't going to slack. He held himself to extremely high standards. He also held his subordinates to really high standards. And, you know, whenever he was under a general during this this last period in his, his career, he would have never dreamt of showing up late in the morning or especially not leaving before his uh, superiors left. And that's exactly what he found when he got to London. These people were coming in, moseying in on these Sundays, which again, it's a weekend, but it's wartime. Right. Also, absolutely appalled to find people uh, leave before him. So the only other like work environment where I've seen this sort of attitude was when I lived in Beijing. I actually roomed with a Hong Kong banker. Shout out to Han. He had this thing, you know, when he was working, he would always say, all these young guys, 
coming out of uh, college. They show up and they leave before me, their superior. He's like, you're not getting anywhere doing that. So he also had that like, one does not leave before his superior. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just feel like that's a that's a good rule of thumb unless like you're in a, I don't know, I just feel like in a military environment especially, that would probably be the, the way to go. If you're trying to advance. Right. Like you need to be there before the guy <laughs> who has the power to promote you and be there after he's gone. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. Yeah, but I definitely put him on notice, and he he also put them on a uh, on a strict seven day per week schedule. So despite the fact that Ike was really kind of pretty hard on pretty hard on everyone else, he was also working hard. But he also had a life that was I don't even want to say it was outside of the military, but I'd say connected to and adjacent to. So high on Ike's list of priorities was a uh, a woman by the name of Kay Summersby. Miss Summersby. Mm. When Britain entered World War II in 1939, Summersby joined the British Mechanized Transport Corps, MTC, uh, where she served as an ambulance driver. She earned the reputation of being an excellent navigator during the London Blitz in 1940 and 1941. When the U.S. entered the war, Summersby was assigned to serve as a chauffeur for a high-ranking American uh, officer. And that is how she met Ike. So in May of 1942... When Ike was still a major general, he had taken a brief trip to London, and uh, the two kind of hit it off. Ike was immediately taken by her good looks, and not to mention she was really intelligent. And also significantly younger than Ike and uh, Mamie. And uh, engaged to be married. Yeah, that's, you know, a little side note. As as we've seen before, Ike didn't really have a problem with uh, messing with women who were either engaged or already married. But what's the problem? He's already married, too. Yeah, I mean, whatever. You know, marriage vows more of a uh, guidebook than a hard and fast rule. (laughs) But there is a lot of debate among Eisenhower biographers about the nature of their relationship. But Gene Edward Smith spends many pages dancing around the fact that they were having an affair. He definitely comes down on the side of they did, but he takes his sweet time getting there. Yeah, he really spends a, a long time just sort of going back and forth because, as, as we'll mention later, Ike, after, after his relationship with Kay, comes to an end with the war. He really goes out of his way to try to downplay their relationship. And his son, who sort of managed his legacy, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, really went out of his way, too, to try to downplay the fact that they ever had any sort of relationship that wasn't uh, strictly professional. You know, I personally come down on the side that that they definitely had a physical relationship, particularly because Kay went on to write her own memoirs. And in it, she, you know, is very explicit about the fact that they were involved in a in a sexual relationship as well as a deep friendship. But, uh, you know, at the very least, she was Ike's closest friend and confidant throughout the war. And he and, you know, she was by his side throughout the entire time while he was in London. He was under a ton of pressure. Uh, you know, at this point, not only was Ike in charge with like the highest level of executive duty in terms of running the whole operation, but he was also still, uh, he had a large hand in commanding the like day-to-day operation, which is a lot. Ike, <laughs> Ike took to smoking three to four packs of cigarettes a day to calm his nerves and uh, was really, really pushing hard for a cross-channel attack in 1942. He believed that the United States and Britain were ready to to go right at France, but the leaders of Britain and uh, Churchill. Yeah, so Churchill and FDR both disagreed, and so they, uh, they favored an attack on North Africa first and then to establish a hold and attack what they considered to be like a weak, the weak underbelly of Europe. And so that kind of brings us to Operation Torch, which was the, the war effort in North Africa. And, you know, the invasion of North Africa was not necessarily Ike's finest hour. He, like I said before, he was under a ton of pressure, and he also had a lot of detractors by this point in his career. Members of, especially the British member of the Combined Chiefs of Staff, they felt that he was unprepared for such a command, having never actually commanded troops before. And they might have been right. Yeah, uh, it's that specter of World War I haunting yeah. Ike again. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we, we talked about it before. He, he sort of saw it coming by the end of the war. Yeah. Uh, by this point in the war, France had fallen to Germany, and the Vichy government was in control. Uh, by extension, they also controlled uh, France's colonies in North Africa. So Torch was launched on November 8, 1942. The objective was to take Algeria and Morocco and then Tunis. The initial fighting in Algeria and Morocco lasted for three days. The French lost 3,000 men, 21 ships, and 135 of their 168 planes, while the Allies lost 3,000 men, 21 ships, and 70 planes. Eisenhower decided that 
you know, losses were unacceptable and needed to end the fighting as soon as possible. And so he set General Mark Clark to sign a, an armistice with the Vichy commander in chief, Admiral Jean Francois Darlin. Their agreement came to be known as the Clark Darlin Agreement. Under the terms of the Clark Darlin Agreement, all French resistance would halt, but Darlin would remain High Commissioner of North Africa. This <laughs> was so controversial at the time because. A little bit more than problematic. Yeah, I mean, the Vichy government was pretty much like the Nazi French. And FDR and especially Churchill were furious that, that Eisenhower allowed this to come to pass. But it did, and he was widely criticized. Darlin eventually would go on to be assassinated on December 24th by a man named uh, Ferdinand... Bo- oh, I'm going to butcher the name. Ferdinand Bonnier de, de la Chapelle. I'm glad you got that one. <laughs> man, that was rough. <laughs> Which w- was like a really like a strange incident because Chappelle, he kills Darlin and then is apprehended and then immediately executed. He was supposed to stand trial and up until his execution, you know, he uh, he claimed that there was a, a power higher than the the Vichy government that was going to, you know, swoop in and save him. More or less, what this means is that Chappelle was probably working with the allies who, yeah. you know, had told him like, don't worry, we'll get you out of this at the end because it's important to under the under the Clark Darlin agreement even though the Vichy were still in power, they, they had to answer to the, the allies. Right. So that had sort of established a pecking order. So, you know, Chappelle would have thought, they coming. Yeah, they're coming for me. But uh, it's all good, y'all. They never did. <laughs> and, uh, and he was executed by firing squad on December 26, 1942. Man, that is rough. I wonder, like, okay, we can only speculate here, but it seems like they definitely did leave him out to dry. Oh, absolutely they left him out to dry. That's, that's what they call tying up loose ends. <laughs> We're not having anyone talk about this. They're like, we don't even have to kill him? Yeah. Please. Oh, Made their man. job easy. All right, so as we mentioned earlier, Ike was already under tremendous pressure, smoking all them cigarettes, having a hard time dealing with the stress. But after the, the clark Darwin agreement, things only got worse. He really kind of like lost his focus. He, he wasn't keeping his eye on the ball, as they say. You know, he really dragged his feet, moving his headquarters off of the Rock of Gibraltar, which is where he was uh, stationed before. And he took a long time in getting to the front. In Tunisia, he really allowed the assault to get bogged down, having the troops available to probably bring it to a swift end, but not visiting in time to to really see that. By the time he finally did visit the front on uh, Christmas Eve, he saw that due to excessive rainfall, a decisive battle would have to wait. The combined chiefs of staff, which I don't think we've touched on yet, but the combined chiefs of staff were just made up of the leaders of Britain and France and their cabinet i guess for i don't know if it was technically officially a cabinet by that point or what but more or less they're they're military commanders um so ike although he was in charge of that theater he took his directions from the combined chiefs of staff the combined chiefs of staff definitely noticed ike being a little frazzled i guess is a is a decent word for that and they (laughs) you know they're like oh having a rough patch promotion uh, so <laughs> the right type of promotion, right? So he ends up getting promoted to a four-star general, but they they changed the command structure. No, no longer would Ike be handling the day-to-day operations. They installed uh, three accomplished British officers under him to to handle the day-to-day. So so Ike Ike would handle the high-level stuff, the uh, politicking and uh, handling the allies and and all that sort of thing. But he wouldn't have to worry about the day-to-day anymore. And honestly, this really played to Ike's skills. Yeah. Being someone who, fortunately or unfortunately, did not see combat, yeah. it was probably better placed for combat veterans to. Yeah, and, and, you know, like, we talked about his uh, exposure to Fox Connor and, you know, how he kind of rubbed off on Ike, but still, like, the basis of Ike's military education came from uh, West Point, where they were really behind the times, and so these British officers who had been veterans of World War One like, understood what it took to win these campaigns more so than Ike did. It's also important to point out that these victories, especially in North Africa, they weren't great military victories. You know, the, the United States was, was successful in their invasion of North Africa, but it wasn't because of any... Strategic genius. Yeah, exactly. It really, like, the, the United States really out-produced the Germans in, in North Africa. We just, we never had higher quality tanks than the Germans did. We just had a whole lot more and we had a lot more people and we had a whole lot more supplies and you just (laughs) keep throwing numbers at the problem until basically they won. And you know, as they say, quantity has a quality all its own. And really throughout the war, this is a formula that the United States kind of tended to follow. You know, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our infantrymen didn't have 
a whole lot of training. You know, they would go off to basic and they'd be there for a few weeks. Uh, and then we would send them out to combat. And we understood that, hey, if they survive, you know, they'll be as good as any veterans on the other side. But, you know, they've got to survive first. I remember learning that a Japanese teenager, uh, they started their military training in part um, in association with their, their education, their high school education. But by the time that they actually entered into the, the army, they had far more training yeah. than your average uh, American soldier. And it showed in their performance. Like, American units often, you just did not maneuver with Japanese units. They were just, in terms of that part of the fighting, they were superior. So Yeah, and I mean, it, in North Africa, it was the same thing. Like they, Rommel ran circles around. Yeah, absolutely. Allies. And due to censorship during the time, the American public didn't really realize it. But during, during the North African campaign, the United States, in particular, did it really poorly. And uh, Rommel absolutely was just whooping them except for the, you know and then he ran out of ran out fuel, of planes yeah, fuel, out of fuel and tanks ammunition. and uh, it was an ugly victory but you know it was a victory got these w's though yeah gotta get that dub and uh ike at the very least he grew as a leader he found who his incompetent officers were and he got rid of them and he also became using uh excuse me he became a lot more comfortable using air power and tanks it's the rocky strategy basically you absorb a lot of punishment <laughs> yeah. but you keep coming and you knock the dude out just keep end. swinging for the fences <laughs> We ain't got no Apollo creeds out here. Right. Going back to the, the book that we based this on uh, by Gene Edward Smith, he, he really points to the next operation, which was uh, Corkscrew, as a turning point for Ike. This was the invasion of a tiny island, uh, again, going to butcher the name, probably Penteleria. And the, the value of Penteleria was that it sat between Tunisia and Sicily, and Sicily was the next target. And so this allowed them to have a, like a halfway point between the two. And it wasn't a glorious battle. It wasn't anything crazy strategic genius though no like, there's a thing Come on like, now. he re i really didn't need to show any strategic genius here either but but the reason it was important was because he asserted his authority as a supreme commander contrary to the wishes of his subordinates before this you know ike was a leader who and and it's a good quality and he and he kept good parts of it to like to listen to his subordinates and let them weigh in and help him make his decisions but this was really the first time that Ike was like, listen, I'm a supreme commander for a reason, and I'm making these calls. I don't care what you say. Penteleria, though very tiny, was well fortified and did not have any beaches, making it extremely dangerous to attempt an invasion. Ike's advisors tried to tell him that invading Penteleria was just going to be a bloodbath, and an unnecessary one, because it was convenient, definitely, to have a midway point, but not necessary. They could launch the invasion of Sicily from North Africa. But Ike, you know... He was like, I'm the boss. And he ordered a three-week-long bombing campaign on June 11, 1943. 11,000 Italian soldiers who were garrisoned at Pantelleria surrendered before the Allied soldiers even set foot on the island. See, he knew they weren't about that action. <laughs> so all of this sets up Operation Husky, uh, which was the amphibious invasion of Sicily, which at that time was the largest amphibious invasion to ever take place in human history. I don't know what Agamemnon has to say about this, but until that point, it was the biggest show there ever was. And Ike was not in charge of a lot of the day-to-day -day operations that were going on, but it was still pretty sloppy at the end of the day. Probably the most tragic thing that happens during this invasion is the decimation of the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Now, you might be thinking, what did these Germans or Italians do to this parachute infantry regiment? The answer is not nearly as much as their fellow soldiers did to yeah. them. Major blue on blue. Yeah, so as they were flying over the invasion fleet, the fleet opened up on the 144 planes that were flying them over Sicily. And they actually ended up shooting down 23 of the planes. And 37 were heavily damaged. Which is crazy. It, it's nuts. It's still, I mean, is it still the worst blue on blue? Uh, I believe Smith says it was, so unless something bigger has happened since that book was published in 2012, which I doubt, doubt it. it. Yeah, heavily doubt it. Ab yeah. Absolutely doubt it. 1,400 paratroopers were, were killed and or missing in action as a result of this uh, friendly fire accident. And then not to mention, so the island is being defended by, by Italian troops, and and they, they were, again, not about that action. <laughs> they were not about that action. I mean, they definitely weren't as... Uh, let's say, well-trained or committed to well, the war. Plus, I mean, the writing was on the wall. Right, as the Germans were. Well, rather than doing a good job in making sure that the Germans couldn't land any troops on the island, that's, you know, exactly what they did. Two divisions. Um, two divisions under Field Marshal Marshal hmm, 
Kessel Kessel ring? Kessel ring? I, I don't know. My German's a little rough. My German is non-existent. <laughs> uh, so uh, two German divisions uh, reinforced the two that were already on the island. And these German divisions reaped havoc uh, while they were on the island. But, you know, you would think that the allies would at least be able to deal with these German divisions and eliminate them on the island. Again, you would be wrong. Ike and, you know, again, Ike not, no longer in charge of the day-to-day, but, like, still, as a Supreme Commander, I feel like responsibility should fall to him, but the Allies were just completely outmaneuvered by Kessel Ring. Like, Basically, he, they overestimated themselves and underestimated the Germans. Absolutely. He, he just retreated to Mount Etna, and he held up. Which, the crazy thing is, too, considering they just got done fighting the Germans in North Africa. Yep. How do you find yourself surprised that, hey, these guys can fight? But to make matters worse... They were not able to encircle and destroy these German armies. What? For 38 days. <laughs> yeah. Now to mention, let's, let's also point out that they thought the invasion of Sicily would be complete in two weeks. Right. It took six. Yep. Um, so three times what they were expecting. And to make matters worse, they don't destroy these German uh, armies. They actually allow these armies to retreat back to Italy. One of the most successful withdrawals in military history. Yeah, it was basically a blunder. Yeah, I mean, Smith gives us the number, and this is a quote out of his book, and he says, he says, all four German divisions were evacuated intact across the Strait of Messina, along with 70,000 Italian troops, 10,000 trucks, and 47 tanks. The withdrawal, one of the most successful in military history, went largely uncontested. What <laughs> are you doing? Absolutely mind-blowing. I've never, you know, obviously we've never commanded armies or anything like that, yeah. but... This seems like a disappointment. And the thing is, like, I, I don't know. I feel like I would be less quick to judge if if the reaction had been, like, disappointment. But, you know, the Allies were so pumped. And yeah. I mean, I get it. It's a success. Don't get us wrong. It is absolutely a success. But I don't know. It just... Qualified success. Yeah, qualified success. It's like somebody walking up on you, punching you in the face, and then running away. And you're like, yeah, you get out of here. Yeah. And then everyone is partying. Yeah. Super pumped. And then what happens? Yeah, then Patton. Then Patton happens. And, and Patton, you know, let's, let's not diminish what he did. To, I mean, Patton is obviously, I mean, he's, military he's a military genius. legend. Yeah. Military legend. He, he does what he does. But part of what he does is slapping dudes around. Yeah. Uh, so Now, granted, like, you know, this was a time before, you know, we, we have a lot. We're, I, I like to say we're, we're a lot more enlightened about PTSD and, and that sort of thing. And that, and that was not necessarily the, uh, the case. During World War II, but man, Patton's actions, inexcusable. So Patton had just completed this hard push uh, to Messina. And if you don't know anything about Patton, one thing you need to know is he pushes his guys hard. Yeah, he was Um, intense. So in Smith's biography of Eisenhower, he describes this incident that takes place. And I'm going to quote him directly here. He says, Patton, who was relentlessly pressing his troops forward, visited a frontline hospital where he toured the wards and spoke with the wounded. When he discovered a soldier with no apparent wounds, Patton lost his self-control, slapped the man twice, and called him a, and forgive me here, goddamn coward. Ridiculous. So, uh, you know, we've come a long way in terms of how we deal with PTSD. We understand that it is a, you know, a very serious uh, condition and that soldiers can often be, you know, wounded in ways that aren't visible. And At least back in the 1940s, the U.S. armed forces and really armed forces in general didn't necessarily have this concept. I mean, we they had talked about during World War One that whole thousand yard stare, yeah, um, and the kind of shell shock, but it really hadn't become a thing just yet. Right. So, so what happens next? Patton Patton realizes the errors of his ways. Yeah, he learns his lesson because this was this was a big issue. Wait, 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 wait. That's not actually what happened. Yeah. No, what actually happened was that he did it again. He doubles that. He does it again one week later. Go ahead. Go ahead, Melvin. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me go again and, and quote uh, Smith's biography of Eisenhower again. He says, he repeated the episode a week later at another field hospital where he called another soldier whom he thought ought to be shot and then pulled out his pistol from his holster and threatened to do it himself. Patton then struck the man with such force that his helmet liner was knocked off. And then, and uh, Smith quotes Patton here, he says, I won't have these coward bastards hanging around our hospitals. Uh, he told the surgeon in charge, we'll probably have to shoot them sometime anyway, or we'll raise a breed of morons. A breed of morons. Yeah, so that tells you a lot about how Patton 
kind of uh, felt about what we call now, you know, PTSD and about pushing his uh, troops. Yeah, and to I think it's a, it's a nice little glimpse into Patton's character overall. Yeah. So Ike finds out about this and he, he writes Patton a sternly worded letter. There's some speculation as to whether or not Ike would have handled this differently if Patton hadn't been so valuable. But, you know, the fact of the matter was that despite his actions, Patton was an extremely valuable asset to Eisenhower. And uh, he judged him as, as too big of an asset asset to lose. He did his best to kind of try to contain the news that and, and hoped and prayed this didn't get back to the to the U.S., but it, it absolutely did. And again, Ike faced a firestorm of criticism. In an attempt to distance himself from the whole situation, Ike sends a spokesman out to answer questions from the press. And when asked whether or not Patton had been punished, the spokesman alludes to the fact that he had not been officially punished at all, even though Ike had sent him a reprimand, and in and, and Patton's response, he had shown a lot of remorse and, and that sort of thing. It just wasn't relayed to the press very well, and so the American press just absolutely ate Ike alive for this. Yeah, and I, I think it kind of just shows that, at least in the military circles, that the that kind of uh, stress, that, that psychic stress that kind of comes from being in combat, just uh, the, the PTSD just wasn't a thing and it wasn't really taken uh, nearly as seriously back then as it was or is today. Yeah, and the whole storm eventually passed, but it, it certainly wasn't the last time that uh, Patton created problems for Ike. After the invasion of Italy... Next comes the big boy. Yeah, you know, they, they had their eyes set on, on France and uh, Ike, Ike definitely wanted to lead that. He, he felt like he was much more ready than he had been before, but he also sort of saw the writing on the wall that he was probably going to be called to be uh, FDR's chief of staff. That was a position that was currently held by uh, George Marshall. And FDR was not eager to lose Marshall as his chief of staff. First of all, in the eyes of the combined chiefs of staff, things were working pretty well. They had good chemistry. They didn't want to lose Marshall there. And also, in the eyes of the American people, including Congress, Marshall could do no wrong. And so when Marshall went to Congress to ask for anything, he was more or less given it. You know, that's, do you shake that up? Just, right. just to let Marshall go. And, and also, Ike's kind of uniquely positioned to take over this invasion of, of France. Yeah. I mean, Ike has already led an amphibious invasion, so he knows a lot about those type of operations. And he's also conducted a lot of research on the ground in France, so he knows the terrain. And then on top of that, Ike has been leading this sort of multinational coalition. He's, he's done that on numerous occasions. So he's positioned to kind of fall into this role as the supreme allied commander in Europe and to kind of lead uh, this invasion of France. Yeah. And that brings us to... Operation Overlord. Right. So as you guys probably all know, Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy really important uh, moment in the war. It's basically when the Allied forces, so you have the uh, Americans, the French, a few French, the Canadians, and the British uh, landing at Normandy in uh, northern France. And this, I mean, the operation took a lot to... Uh, There's a lot of cool stories that, about people who were, I would like to cover later. Uh, yeah. In different different episodes, people who fought on the grounds, and also like the spy and intrigue stories that went yeah. into diverting uh, attention away from Normandy. from Normandy over to Calais. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, what can we say about the operation? I mean, I think in terms of how it actually plays out, it works out a little bit better than, uh, well, a lot better than the invasion of Sicily. Yeah, but you know the uh, the call to give the go ahead was was in Ike's hands, and uh, that was something that he he took very seriously. And you know he had a, a lot of I don't know if trepidation is the right word, but he. He really recognized that that he was sending a lot of of young men to their deaths the yeah. night before he you know there was a thin window at first they thought that the weather wasn't going to permit the invasion and then when it was made clear that he he would be able to but more or less had to make a decision quickly he reportedly sat in silence for 5 minutes before giving the go ahead and I think that 5 minutes of just absolute silence is just it sort of speaks to the the weight of command and the and yeah. how much it's a lonely place. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine having to make a decision that will literally change the course of the war and yeah. send thousands of young men to their death? I mean, change the course of history. Yeah. I mean, at that point, you know, the Germans had turned uh, Western Europe into a 
freaking castle of just grinding defense. And, you know, the Russians are fighting basically in Europe by themselves on the, on on the, the Eastern, Eastern Front. front. Uh, so he's got a narrow window because, you know, launching these sorts of naval kind of these amphibious invasions, it's not just put everybody on the boat right. and send them. The tides have to be right. The weather has to be right. And the weather at that point in time wasn't cooperating. So right. when they, he got that, that little bit of light underneath the door, he said, you know, we gotta go. Let's, let's take it. Yeah, and, and you know, the night before the invasion, he, he made a point of, of visiting some of the paratroopers that were going to be the first to land and, you know, just going, spending time, shaking hands, you know, well-wishing, that sort of thing. And, and uh, reportedly, he, just, he spent the night of the invasion, a sleepless night, just up smoking with only Kay Summers be by his side. Yeah. Uh, well, long story short, you know, for most of the invasion beaches, they're able to kind of uh, get on land and push in, you know, without the kind of as according to plan. But there was some issues at the American beaches. A lot of the bombardment from the ships, they overshot the, the beaches. And so a lot of the German defenses were were intact. Um, so there was a very it was a very bloody, bloody day. But um, Ike and the soldiers, they got through it. And uh, as you guys know, the rest was history on that. Now, one thing that we really haven't touched on a whole lot that uh, I think is important to kind of go back and at least discuss a little bit is, is the fact that, you know, when France fell, you know, their leader, their military, their higher ups in the military had to, to flee. And uh, one of those people who fled was uh, General Charles de Gaulle, who had been a, a, uh, a war hero of the First World War and had sort of been at the center of the uh, French resistance. And he was extremely popular among the French people and sort of presumed to be the next president of, of France if and when France was retaken by the Allies. He wasn't directly involved, not because he wasn't officially the leader of the French forces, but again, he led what was called the Free French Movement, who had a lot to do with the French resistance. There was also French communists in Paris specifically that were very large faction of the uh, resistance movement but de gaulle was sort of seen by the by the allies except for fdr as the the heir apparent to uh, the face of the resistance yeah and one of the most important things that that ike did in his in his role as a supreme commander was to sort of outmaneuver fdr in terms of de gaulle ike had a really good personal relationship with de gaulle and he viewed him as a as a good leader but also he recognized that if they put someone else in power, they very much risk losing the, the French resistance, which, which is becoming more and more important to keep pressure on the Germans in occupied France. And the communists were, I mean, they were kind of making moves in Paris uh, while all of this was going on. So I think that, you know, that desire to kind of get their guy in there and in control may have also factored into Ike's kind of pushing for... Uh, de Gaulle to kind of just kind of slide into that leadership position. Yeah, and you know it was interesting because as as much as I'm sure FDR and and his administration didn't want to see any communists taking power in France, I sort of understand Roosevelt's position. He he wasn't necessarily anti anti De Gaulle. He was just pro have an election. <laughs> yeah, know, he was, was like... he was pro democracy, and he didn't want to be seen as just putting de installing. In power. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, Ike was like, I'm going to do it. Yeah, and, and to be fair, de Gaulle had a strong chance of actually winning um, any sort of election that would have taken place at that time. Yeah, and to that end, it was important for Ike to take Paris and insert de Gaulle. Uh, even though this wasn't really a strategic, a strategically important location, and it's hard to describe with, with just words, it's sort of, lends itself better if you look at a map of, of how their offensive was going and their drive through Paris to chase the Germans, but Paris wasn't really strategically important, although... Drive through France. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. Drive through France. But although they, it, it was important to the French, specifically to de Gaulle, to make sure that they took Paris, because in his mind, and he's probably right, whoever frees Paris is the hero of, of France and ends up and would would likely end up in power, and so oh yeah, and and think about just the the media frenzy and the PR that you can do when the Allies liberate the French capital of Paris. Yeah. You know, like it's it's a big deal. Yeah, and so he was putting a lot of pressure on Ike to not only take Paris and, and you know sort of alter their plan uh, to take Paris, but also to make sure that a Frenchman leads the attack on Paris. 
but you know there was a lot of resistance the germans had control of of the city and there was you know for for something that wasn't necessarily seen as a as a strategically important point there was going to be a lot of bloodshed it was going to be you know s- fighting block by block building by building and uh, it was going to slow down the war effort and it was going to uh, result in a lot of damage additionally de gaulle had heard through the grapevine that fdr's administration was working on a clark darlin-esque agreement with the Vichy government in Paris. And so that is the last thing that de Gaulle wanted to see happen. And and neither did I. The German general who was in charge of holding Paris, uh, his name was General Dietrich von Scholitz. Um, and he had been destruct, uh, excuse me, he had been instructed by Hitler to either hold the city or to destroy it. And uh, this was a man who was very conscious of his, of his legacy. He, yeah. uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, Smith describes him as like one of the last Prussians. And, you know, he had a lot of pride and he, had a, he placed a lot of value on honor and, and that sort of thing. And in his mind, he was okay with, if, if Paris was going to be destroyed in a, in a battle, that was one thing, but he wasn't just going to be the man who, who destroys this historic city for no reason. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'd be like, you know what? I ain't going to be me. Right. And that's pretty much what he said. Direct quote. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so he decided that he would defy Hitler. Brave dude. Yeah, very brave dude. And so he contacts the allies and he was like, listen, they're going to replace me when they realize that I'm not blowing up the city. And you have a very short, or you have a very small window of time to come here and I will surrender the city to you. So Ike arranged for French General Philippe Leclerc to go ahead and take the city. And, you know, when he arrived, there was some some small fighting which was more of like a an honor thing from the germans before they they gave the city over to the allies and man when when de gaulle gets there it is like a roman triumph can you imagine how much wine was drunk on that day champagne man. pop the bottles de gaulle's back germans gone we out here yeah and and you know it's crazy the pictures smith has some really great pictures uh, in his book. And I'm sure if you just Google, Google image search this stuff, you'll see, but people are just lining the streets while de Gaulle walks through, you know, he's this tall, like striking figure. And, and they just, they knew that they were free more or less. The, the Germans were gone. Paris celebrated like crazy. He, he went on foot all over the city and just every street was just completely filled with people. And can you imagine the relief? Because if you're, if you're a Parisian, you know, you're waiting for the conflict. You're waiting for the battle, and you have no idea if you're going to make it through this. Yeah. And then these guys show up with scarcely a shot and liberate the city. Yeah. Insane. Yeah, and you know, after uh, they took the city, Ike made a special point of visiting de Gaulle in, I'm going to butcher these names, my goodness. He, he, he paid a formal call to de Gaulle at Palais de, de Alisi. Mm, I don't know. That's you what don't speak French? With. Huh? Huh? You don't speak French? No, you know I don't. Okay. Uh, but anyway, that's where the president lived, and that had been the the presidential home, more or less the White House of France, and uh, that is where de Gaulle had taken up residence. And what what this was was it was Ike as the supreme commander paying tribute to the French president. So he was saying without saying that de Gaulle was was here to stay. Nice. Yeah. And, and, you know, this really represented a, uh, it was kind of like Ike's coming out party as a political player. This was, this was more, this was not a military move. This very likely extended the war. And, you know, just to get, just to be completely direct about it, it probably cost a fair bit of lives because every, you know, every day there was fighting, people were dying. And uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And this was a, a political decision that Ike made. But and, politically, it smelled like roses. Yeah. Yeah. And he was really able to, show his ability as a political player. But this went pretty well, but things kind of get darker a little a little bit after this, right? Yeah. His, you know, definitely a political talent. Not still, still not a military genius. Genius. You know, we've talked about some of the flaws that were at play in his military education and he was a an advocate of like the broad front strategy, which is more or less, you know, extending your forces along a broad a long line and slowly meeting every point with these, for lack of a better word, like less intense attacks. It was, it was like a, it was an attrition strategy. It was a World War One strategy. It's what Pershing did, and he was he was a student of Pershing. But 
the British general who was under him, Montgomery, he advocated for a different kind of strategy. And, and honestly, this, this came a lot from the fact that Montgomery had seen the horrors of World War I firsthand. He had fought in World War I. He had seen what attrition warfare looked like, and he wasn't about to do it again. And so Montgomery's strategy— Not to mention he'd seen what the Germans put on him uh, earlier in the war. Exactly. And so Montgomery's strategy was, was much more con- concentrated. It was like a single thrust strategy where he would outmaneuver the enemy to the best of his abilities, find a weak point in their line, and then just punch through with a concentrated force right then and there. And that strategy had worked. Their whole push through France was predicated on Montgomery's single thrust strategy, and it was going great. But on September 1st of 1944, which is just a few days after they took Paris, which I believe was August 26th of 1944, Ike decided that he was, you know, he was retaking control of the, the ground operations. And really, in hindsight, it's easy to see that, that this was another political maneuver. I, you know, Smith doesn't say directly, but it, it sure seems like Ike had politics on his mind and a political career in the future on his mind. He wanted to be seen as the hero of Europe, and he knew whoever finished the fight was going to be perceived as the hero. Well, if it ain't broke, mess it up. Break it. Seriously. So Ike takes control, and he switches them over to the broad front strategy. And, and really, there was a lot of problems with the way that the whole, the whole thing went down with, with him switching things up. It was, it was working perfectly well before, and Ike just decided to mess with it. And uh, in a later interview, General Montgomery was actually quoted as saying, The whole command setup was fundamentally wrong. There was no one who could give his complete and undivided attention to the day-to-day direction of the land battle as a whole. Eisenhower had no experience, the knowledge, or the time. He should have been devoting himself to questions of overall strategy, to political problems, to problems of inter-allied relations and military government. Instead, he insisted on trying to run the land battle himself. Here he was out of his depth, and in trying to do this, he neglected his real job on the highest level. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, perhaps the best illustration of the consequences that came with Ike taking command here was the Battle of the Bulge. And Ike later acknowledged that, that, you know, the Battle of the Bulge was kind of on him. Yeah, it was pretty much on him. So the Battle of the Bulge was this massive German counterattack, which took place in December of 1944. Through January. Through January. And it's basically is called the Battle of the Bulge because it produced this massive bulge uh, in the Allied lines. It forced a lot of uh, the Allied troops back. And if you've ever heard of the combat that took place around Bastogne, um, it's absolutely uh, the stuff of kind of, of, of military legend. Uh, but the Germans kind of, this was their last gasp. This was their last attempt to turn the war um, on the Western Front. And it was costly for both sides. Yeah. I mean, the, the Germans' losses totaled eighty to 100,000. Plus, they depleted what was left of their, their armored forces. Yep. And the Allies lost a considerable number of troops too so this yeah, kind american of american deaths in like the the 80,000s yeah it was nuts i mean in this this attack too it came through a a heavily wooded region that the allies really didn't think that armored units could could push through and it very well may have been avoided avoidable if they had just stuck to well, yeah. montgomery strategy yeah so this was for the americans uh it was a pretty uh a pretty significant for the americans and the allies it was a pretty significant setback um, that in a lot of ways can be tied back, like as you said, to, uh, to uh, Eisenhower's decision to kind of take the reins and uh, be the liberator of uh, Europe. Yeah, and I mean, listen, like we, we say that, but I mean, neither of us are, are necessarily military historians, and so I'm, I'm sure that there are arguments for Eisenhower taking the reins, but Smith certainly comes down on the, on the side of, eh, shouldn't have done it. Should not have done it. And, uh, you know, there are real consequences to that sort of stuff. You know, although there were, thousands of american lives lost that really was the last hurrah for for hitler in terms of trying to fight an offensive war that that was it from that point forward he was fighting defensive war and that was it yeah the allies rebounded uh, nicely yeah i mean again like the, the allies were just out producing the germans and yeah and i mean they they just continued to replace troops and to replace supplies that's well, crazy i mean it's clear that the germans and 
their allies to some extent didn't kind of understand the nature of the warfare that they were facing. I mean, the Germans didn't, I don't believe they nationalized their you know, industries until like 19, something ridiculous, like 1944, yeah. where you've got the U.S. Uh, and its Fighting allies total ranking war. out stuff for everybody. Yeah. Russians, you need Studebaker trucks, we got you. Yep. You know, so it was just a different type of uh, different type of conflict. Yeah, and I mean, we haven't really talk, talked about the Russians at all, but by this time, Stalin had had taken power and was and was closing in on Berlin from the east. And, you know, obviously we'll touch on this later, but what will be recognized as Cold War tensions by historians were already sort of brewing. Bubbling up to the yeah, surface. By, you know, there was the the British and the Americans who were hoping to continue to spread democracy uh, across Europe. And on the other on the other side you had their ally, Stalin, who was a communist and wanting to promote that so it was it was important for the allies to to take berlin because in fdr and churchill's opinion if stalin got there first then there was a high chance of the german government being a communist one yeah it was basically a competition for spheres of influence basically and you know to what extent would certain parts of Europe and certain parts of Asia be drawn into a sort of Western Europe, American sort of liberal democratic sphere of influence or a uh, Soviet sphere of influence? That became the new question as the war started to draw to a close. So following the Battle of the Bulge, Ike actually goes around the wishes of FDR and Churchill and the combined chiefs, and he meets Stalin outside of Berlin and you know, allows Stalin to, to take the city. Yeah, I mean, basically, everyone understood that it was going to be one heck of a fight, a bloody fight. And, uh, you know... If, and the Russians had seen quite a few losses. And it, Yeah, and it seemed kind of fair, given what the Russians had, uh, had dealt with on the Eastern Front, to let them finish off the Germans. If, in terms of the fighting... The Allies in the West certainly did a lot of work, but the Russians did the heavy lifting. Yeah, that puts us at the spring of 1945. Uh, on April 12th, FDR dies. Hitler commits suicide on April 30th, or does he? Dum 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 dum. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, there's a lot of speculation that maybe he escaped and chilling and in Argentina. Chilling in Argentina, but where? Where if he was, I, I would have found been, him like a cowboy. Oh yes. my gosh, he would have been. Can you imagine that Western alternative history? Oh man, that's what that's what we should screenplay. Be what are we doing this for? Hey, we just gave away our screenplay. Yeah, man, I'm depressed now. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Hitler commits suicide on April 30th, and on uh, May 7th, the Germans formally surrendered to to Ike at Reims, and the war for Europe was over. Yeah. All right, and I think that's a pretty good place to stop for uh, part two of the life of Dwight Eisenhower. When we, when we come back next time, we will pick up from there where he's a military governor of the U.S. section of Berlin and then talk about his presidency and, and all that stuff. All right, we'll see you then. Yep, see you next time. Hey, guys, just a quick message before you take off. Please remember to subscribe. Leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. It really helps get the word out about Life of X. Don't forget to tell a friend. And if you're interested in supporting the show in any other way, please head over to lifeofxpodcast.com and click on our support page. Thank you.